Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Hope everybody's doing really well today. We're going to get started here shortly. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, Sharla, how are you today? We're going to let a couple more people get in here and we're going to go ahead and get this started. Um, got some interesting information for you guys today. We're going to talk about building credit. Um, so that's what that's that's what today's discussion is about. We're going to talk about kind of some of the things you got to think about when you're building credit, kind of how that works, kind of the smart way of of doing that. Um, I think that uh, I think that's that's very important. So we're gonna we're gonna do that today. Um, so that's kind of that. So let's let a couple people get in here, and then we're gonna get underway. So let's give give it a couple minutes here. Um, I would estimate it'll probably take me about 40, 45 minutes to get through what I want to talk about today. And uh, I think we'll be in a good situation. How you doing? Uh, she, me, her, ye, ye. All right, then. So let's give it a couple minutes here. You know, I, um, you know it's interesting because it's football season right now. Um, so I would imagine that uh, a lot of people are probably watching football. I might want to consider doing this on a different day uh, during football season. Um, my Niners are actually playing right now. It's the third quarter, but I'm like, you know, I committed to doing a thing. So, you know, you got to do that thing, right? So, how you doing, Colette? So, I'm going to go ahead and get started because I'm going to save this video anyway. And as I save this video, other people can watch it at a, at a later time. So, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay. So today, you know, it's another hashtag get real woke series, hashtag for the free, hashtag we make it make sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, so now let's go ahead and get started here. When we talk about building credit, so you have to ask yourself a question first and foremost, right? And it's a very important question. Do you just want good credit? Or do you want to have good credit for a purpose? And what do I mean by that, right? Are you building credit just to say, oh, I have a 700 FICO score, I have a 740, I have a 780, whatever it may be, right? If that's all you're building for, then this conversation probably isn't for you um, because it's really simple to generate a positive score, right? But most people that build credit are building credit for a potential purpose. And that purpose is for them to be able to borrow money uh, from some sort of financial institution and to get the best rates they can possibly get, right? So if that's you, you're in the right place. So when I talk about building credit, I'm going to touch on a number of different things. Some of them you won't understand. Some of them I'm going to explain right but you won't really understand the full impact of it until later on when i start talking about how lending works and and kind of how those things work right so when i start getting into that you'll understand why i recommend building credit the way i recommend building credit right so the goal is to put yourself in the best possible lending position to be able to get the best possible rate that you can that should be the goal of building credit and if that's not your goal then i really don't know what you're doing so so when we talk about credit we need to understand first of all what is the difference between good debt and bad debt right so you know people borrow money for different reasons but they only fall into two categories either it's good debt or it's bad debt so let's talk about bad debt first. What is bad debt? Bad debt is debt that is taken out that is not used to create value. What do I mean by that? So if I take a credit card and I book flights, I book a hotel room in another country, I basically finance a vacation, 
Well, that's a bad debt because you're going to be paying interest on that debt for a very long time. And that is not bringing you in any revenue. It's not doing anything for you to increase the value of your overall portfolio. It does nothing for you to build wealth. That's bad debt. If you're going to take a credit card or an installment loan and you're going to go out there and you want to buy a new outfit, you want to, you know, do all these great, wonderful things to look a certain way or project a certain thing. Well, that too is bad debt. Bad debt is anything that does not create value for your overall portfolio that does not help you grow. Good debt is exactly that. It helps you grow. That's what good debt is, right? So good debt are things like if I'm going to take out a loan and I'm going to invest in a piece of income property that's going to make me some money and generate me an equity position over time, well, that's great debt. If I'm going to take out debt to potentially start a business that I have a solid business model for, a solid strategy for, something that's going to create me year over year returns, well, that's good debt too. So good debt increases value. It increases worth, right? It, it creates value for you. It, it opens the door for you to use someone else's money to be able to create more value and increase your the value of your portfolio. That is what good debt is. And so when you think about borrowing money, you should be thinking about it in terms of how is it that I'm going to use this money to better my financial position? If that's not the way you're thinking when you're borrowing money, then the reality of the situation is it's going to be a situation whereby you're going to end up in a bad debt situation. Okay, little housekeeping items. If you have questions, please use the bottom left hand. Uh, there's a little square there in the bottom left hand corner with a question mark. Please post your questions there. I will get to questions at the end. Um, that's generally, I generally try to leave a little time to answer a few questions. Um, so I will do that at the end, but I do see your question, Anna. I will answer that question at a later point. Now, so, so first of all, when we talk about, when we talk about building credit, right now we have to talk about how, what we're doing here, right? So I want to give a little background on a couple of things, right? So before we talk, because this is a building, right? All of this is numbers. I stick to the numbers. Numbers make sense to me. And, and if you stick to the numbers when you're building a financial portfolio, it's very easy to do that. When, and building your financial portfolio starts with building your credit, right? So if you take the same mentality uh, in everything that you do, you find out that you grow your portfolio you know, in a, in a, in a moderately decent rate. And you'll see year over year growth in your investment portfolio. So, you know, a lot of what we talk about moving forward in, in these discussions weekly is going to get technical. It's going to get into numbers, right? Because, you know, men lie, women lie, but numbers don't lie. So let's give a little background here, right? So first of all, we have to understand the two types of the main two interest rates that are really considered uh, when you're thinking about lending, right? The first one is the prime rate. What is the prime rate? The prime rate is the retail lending benchmark. That's what it is. It's a retail lending rate benchmark. So what banks do when they lend to mom and pop, when they lend to consumer, to the consumer base, when they lend to uh, common folks, right? They, they consider a prime rate. So every day, and you can look at it in the Wall Street Journal, it's easy to Google, you can look at the prime rate. The prime rate is the base borrowing rate that institutions look at. So from that base borrowing prime rate, what they're going to do is they're going to put some points on top of it. It might be a few basis points. It might be a few percentage points, depending on what your FICO score is and your overall, uh, the overall uh, quality of your credit profile. And they're going to establish a rate. So let's walk into this, right? So the prime rate, let's say, is 3.5%. Let's say that's the prime rate, right? Okay, 
So what the bank will say is, okay, we'll start our rates out at 599. So that means that if you have a 720 or better and you have a good credit quality profile, if your profile has good credit quality, right, then what they're going to do is to say, we'll give you a 599% interest rate. And from there, the worse your interest rate, the worse your credit is, the worse your the overall uh, quality of your credit profile and your FICO score, they raise the rate. What that's called on Wall Street is a risk premium, right? So we attach a risk premium to lending. So of course, if the baseline rate for average across banks is 599 and you've got a 620 FICO score, uh, there's just no way for you to consider a 599 interest rate. It's just not going to happen. What you're more likely going to get is somewhere around, you know, seven, seven and a half, somewhere around there, right? That's the risk premium associated with the risk of lending money to you. You are a higher probability of defaulting than someone that's got a 720 or better mid FICO score and a better quality credit profile. Now, of course, if your credit profile is terrible, then you're just not a lending candidate, right? But sometimes you can be a lending candidate and still be risky and you just pay, you know, a higher interest rate. So the prime rate is where, where banks start for retail lenders. So there's another rate. And, and there's, there's a number of different rates. There's a Fed funds rate. There's the overnight repo rate. There's the cost of funds index. There's a lot of different rates. But the two rates I'm focusing on is the prime rate, which we just talked about, and number two, the LIBOR. How many people have ever heard of the term LIBOR before? So the LIBOR, what does LIBOR stand for, first of all? It's the London Interbank Offering Rate. The London Interbank Offering offering rate. This is the rate that generally institutions use as a benchmark to lend money to each other. It is also, right, L-I-B-O-R, LIBOR, London Interbank Offering Rate, L-I-B like boy, O like Oscar, R like Romeo, London Interbank Offering Rate. Now, Here's the interesting thing. If you've ever gotten an interest only loan, right? What you'll realize is that your fixed rate term is based on the prime rate. But after your fixed rate term, your note begins to fluctuate, right? The interest rate begins to fluctuate. That fluctuation is based on the volatility or the movement of the London interbank offering rate. So of course the London interbank offering rate goes up and it goes down. Lenders know this so they're smart. They don't want to lend the money out to you cheaper than they got it for. So what they do is they set a floor rate. So if the London interbank, uh, interbank offering rate falls below the floor, floor rate, well you have to pay the floor rate. And if it goes up, well, it's good for the bank, right? So this is a risk preservation tool that banks use when they do interest-only lending to consider how they're going to uh, index against the index the the, the non-fixed period of your interest loan uh, against the LIBOR. Now, here's the other thing: the London Interbank Offering Rate. That's the that that's a benchmark for smart people. See, smart people understand it. We're going to get into this uh, at a later time. But smart people understand securities lending, right? They understand the fact that there are two types of lending that you can do when you have a securities portfolio. One is a margin loan, and a margin loan will allow you to borrow against your securities to invest in other securities, right? Well, you also have securities loans where you can use your securities portfolio as collateral to borrow money. And when you use a securities portfolio to borrow money, 
Oftentimes, the bench rate is the London interbank offering rate. So if you're starting at a lower benchmark, obviously your rate is going to be lower than it would have been had your benchmark been set against the prime rate. See, so when you're building your credit profile, right, you're building with the thought in your mind that you want to get to the lowest interest rate possible. So you want to get into a position where these lenders are going to lend to you based on the London interbank offering rate as the benchmark, as opposed to the prime rate, which is for retail borrowers. Does it make sense? So let's keep it moving, right? Now, so so now that we understand the two main rates that really matter for your purposes, right? So now we want to talk about, let's, let's understand credit utilization. Let's just understand that real quick. And I talked about this in a previous video, but a refresher never helps, never hurts, right? So credit utilization, that calculates, right, the amount of so, so it's the amount of loan you have versus the amount of loan you're actually using. For example, right? Let's say you have a credit card and it has a thousand dollar credit limit on it, but you're only using three hundred dollars of it. So only three hundred dollars is is actually used on the credit card. You now have what's called a thirty percent utilization ratio on that credit card. That's how it works. If you have an installment loan, right? And let's say they gave you a five thousand dollar installment loan. Well, that is so it's always at 100% utilization ratio unless you're paying back principal and interest uh, every single month. Most installment loans are interest only with a balloon payment at the end. So the fact of the matter is you're always only paying interest and then at maturity or at the end of the loan period, right, you're going to pay uh, the, the, the principal back. So therefore, it's always at 100% utilization. And this is very important to understand because a lot of these credit repair expert, well, quote unquote experts always tell you, make sure you keep everything at a 30% utilization ratio. Make sure your credit cards are at a 30% utilization ratio. Make sure your utilization ratio is always 30%. We'll see where they fail at and what they don't understand is that when you're looking at utilization ratio, you have to look at the overall utilization ratio on your credit profile, right? So that calculates, so that calculates, right? your 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 installment loans and it also calculates right your revolving loans so all your lines are counted everything that you have open on your credit profile is counted towards your utilization ratio so let's talk about that so let's say you have an installment loan right for five thousand dollars right we're going to give a nice example of this let's say you have an installment loan for five thousand dollars that's out right that's an installment loan you've already gotten the money you're at a hundred percent utilization there already right so let's say now you have a credit card at a thousand dollars and you have three hundred dollars outstanding on that you're at a thirty percent utilization ratio on that credit card now let's say you have another credit card out. Now this is these are revolving facilities, by the way. These are revolving lines of credit. So let's say you have another credit card that has ten thousand uh, dollars of line on it, and you've got three thousand dollars outstanding. You're at a thirty percent utilization ratio on that credit card as well. However, that doesn't mean that you're at an overall utilization ratio of thirty percent. If you take the total amount of your loans outstanding the percentage of utilization what you realize is you're really taking 160 and dividing it by three the 100 percent utilization ratio on the 5,000 the 30 percent on the thousand dollar revolving facility and the 30 percent on the ten thousand dollar revolving facility so if you take that 160 percent right and you divide that by three what you realize now is you have a 53.33% overall utilization ratio, right? So that's what that means. So if you follow the 30% rule that all of these credit repair people tell you, that means that you would have to bring down your utilization ratios on your credit cards to below 10% to hit an overall utilization ratio of 30%. That's really difficult to do, and also it's showing the lenders that you're really not, not using your credit card very much. Not only that, as your credit mix grows, let's say you get a mortgage. Let's say you get a $250,000 mortgage, 
and now you've got a thirty thousand dollar car loan well these are these are these are installment loans right so of course that's going to raise your utilization ratio so what is the ideal overall utilization ratio where should you be it should be no more than 55 percent overall utilization no more than 50 to 55 percent overall utilization ratio why is that why am i telling you that if anybody has done any type of work in lending or as a mortgage broker of any kind you also understand that there's something called a debt to income ratio and generally we say we don't want you over anywhere between 45 and 55 percent debt to income ratio right that's something we're going to talk about when we talk about lending but one of the things that counts in your debt to income ratio is your outstanding debt so if you're around about the 50 percent overall utilization ratio you're showing good discipline on your credit profile now should you keep your revolving installment loans at 30 percent utilization yes you should but that's going to change based on your overall credit mix so if you have depending on what you have on your credit profile you might actually have to bring those utilization ratios down to 20 25 percent maybe even 15 percent utilization on those revolving credit lines to be able to stay within that 50 55 percent range in overall credit utilization so this is all math at this point right you have to calculate your overall utilization and understand where you are so you understand what adjustments you need to be making in your credit mix to make sure that you are maintaining an overall healthy credit profile it does you no good to have two great utilization ratios on two revolving lines and your other credit utilization ratios are thrown way off because at the end of the day if you're at 60 70 80 percent overall utilization you're not really a credit worthy in individual because once i calculate what you make right versus everything else what it's going to tell me is that you're not a very solid lending candidate you are a risk and so while you may have a 720, 730, 740, the reality of the situation is the overall health or quality of your credit profile is not the best. It is possible to have a great FICO score and a credit profile that is not that, that, that doesn't have much quality to it. A good example of that is somebody who's just starting over. They've been able to successfully get everything off of their credit and they're starting to build credit all over again, right? So it's not uncommon for them to have one or two small dollar secure credit cards, $500, $1,000 or whatever. They're maintaining the utilization ratios. They're paying it on time. They're doing all of that. And yes, on paper, they have a 720 mid FICO score, but they're not a great borrowing candidate if they want to go in there and borrow 50 or 60 or $70,000 from the bank. You just don't have enough of a credit profile for me to justify lending you that kind of money, especially unsecured. You see how this works? So just because someone has a great FICO score doesn't necessarily mean they have a a, a pristine credit profile that's not always an indication of that you have to which is why underwriters look at the entire credit profile not just the fico score i have I, I i know people i have friends who have gone in and tried to get loans for vehicles high-end vehicles and thought just because they had a great fico score that they were going to walk out with the vehicle and such was not the case i mean i had a buddy go in and try to get a porsche boxster and you know when when the 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 uh, the um the auto dealer sales guy or whatever um pulled his credit and all of that like he was very excited i mean they had gassed up the car they had cleaned up the car you know they didn't put armor all on the car they didn't gave him hats coffee mugs shirts everything they think he's driving off the lot 
and the financial institution decided they didn't want to finance him because of the quality of his credit profile, even though he had an over 700 FICO score. He just didn't have enough on the credit profile for them to feel comfortable with, you know, letting him drive off with that kind of a car. That's just reality. So understand that there are two parts to this. Now, so... So here, here's where here, here's where we want to be, right? So your your revolving lines at the end of the day, you want to keep them between fifteen and thirty percent, depending on what your credit mix is, which we just talked about. So now, now that we've covered that, I want to get into the mechanics of building credit the smart way, right? So you got to be smart about this credit building, right? Because remember, what you're building for at the end of the day, right, is the lowest possible interest rate that you can possibly get. So you got to be smart about how you do this. So let's talk about that. So when we walk into this, before before we get into knee deep into this, I need to go over a couple of things with you first. So one is a discussion on interest and yield. And you need to understand what this is because this is going to be a constant theme of discussion as we move into multiple things that I'm going to be talking about, like real estate, securities, building a business. Interest and yield play a very important factor in this when you talk about borrowing or doing anything like that. You got to understand interest and yield. So interest, so so I'm going to talk about it from a buyer standpoint, okay? If I go into the market right now and I buy a bond that has a face value, what is the face value? Face value means that if that bond matures tomorrow, the face value is $1,000, that means that I'm going to get $1,000, right? They owe me a $1,000 face value, right? That's the value of the bond. It's called par, right? So that's the par value of the bond. It's $1,000. If it, if it matures tomorrow or that loan is called tomorrow or it's due tomorrow, they're going to give me $1,000, right? Period. So you got to understand par, right? So now let's say I buy a bond that has a par value of $1,000, right? And let's say the coupon payment, which is the same thing as interest, coupon and interest mean the same thing. Let's say the coupon payment or the interest payment is 5% per year. Now, if I bought that bond at par, that means that the yield to me is one to one. That means that that $50 or that 5% that I'm going to get on that bond represents a true 5% to me. But what happens if I buy that bond that has a par value, a par value of $1,000 at $900? Let's say I can buy it for $900 even though it has a par value of $100. What that means to me in interest, the interest rate may be 5%, but the yield to me is 5.56%. Why is that? Because if I take that $50 interest payment and I divide it by the $900, it's going to give me a 5.56%. What that means is that while the coupon payment or what they're paying me every year is 5%, because I bought the bond cheaper than what its par value is or the value that I'll be able to recoup when they have to give me the money back, right? The actual principal that I bought it for, I'm actually getting $100 more than I bought it for. So I have to amortize that. I have to look at that and calculate that into the rate of return that I'm getting. So what that means to me is even though I'm getting a 5% interest, it's actually yielding me 5.56%. That's very important. Now, what happens if I take that same bond, it has a par value of $1,000, but I buy it at $1,100, right? I've paid more for the bond than the par value is worth or more for the bond than I'm actually going to get when it's time for them to pay the principal back. So now if I take that same $50 or 5% that I'm getting a year and I divide it by 1,100, what I find out is my actual yield is only 4.54%. So even though I'm getting an interest rate or an interest return every year of 5%, it really only, it, it really only materializes to me at 4.54% because I also have to factor in the overpaying that I did for the bond. 
So understanding interest and yield is very, 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 very important. So let's move on. Let's apply yield to borrowing now, right? How do we apply yield to borrowing? This is where it gets really, 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 really fun, right? So we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about now is the power of a certificate of deposit, right? So let's get into that. So let's talk about what you should not use a certificate. First of all, what is a certificate of deposit? A certificate of deposit, and we're going to talk about this. Uh, if I get through this today, then we're going to move on into bank accounts next week, timed accounts and current accounts. But so basically what a certificate of deposit is, is the bank asking you to loan them money and they're going to pay you a specific interest rate for the term that they're holding your money for. It's a timed deposit with the bank. You know, you have six month CDs. Hell, I think you even have three month CDs, 90 day CDs. Um, you have five year CDs, 10 year CDs, et cetera, et cetera. And they all pay an interest rate. Currently, right now, the average interest rate across the different financial institutions, um, the current interest rate on a 10 year CD is 1%. So what a, what is a CD, what, what should you not use a CD for? A CD is not something that you use as a standalone investment. It is not a good idea to just put money in a CD and walk away and say, I'm going to get this interest every month because, or every year. Because the reality of the situation is if a CD is only paying you 1%, well, there's still 3% inflation every year, so you're still a negative 2%. So that's not a very smart investment. However, what a CD can be used for and should be used for is a collateral instrument for borrowing purposes. It should be used for a collateral instrument for borrowing purposes, especially when you're starting out building credit. When you're first starting to build credit, CDs are a great collateral tool to be able to get you off the ground. So what do I mean by that? Let's walk into it. So let's say you take $1,000 and you put it in a CD, right? Now, that CD is generating you 1% per year. It's generating you 1% per year, right? Doesn't sound like a lot. But then you use that CD as collateral to get a secured credit card from the bank. Now the bank gives you a secured credit card at, let's say, $500. So now they've given you a secured credit card for $500 using your CD as collateral, right? Now check this out. Because you only have $500 on the card, while you may only be getting a 1% interest rate, the yield to you is actually 2% because you've only got $500 out that you're working with. So now, if that card, when I looked at the average uh, credit card rates today, average credit card rates are somewhere around, let me see, I actually wrote that down, actually, um, is actually a roughly around 18%, right? So that's the average credit card rate today. But you get to take away 2% on that. Because remember, you're yielding 2% on that $500. So now the 18 looks more like 16 right? So that's a good win for you. Now, so you, you're using your CD as a way to lower the effective interest rate to you. So you're actually borrowing your money cheaper. It's going to get more interesting in a second. Don't you worry. Now, the other thing that you can do, right? The other interesting thing that you could do is you can use a CD as a collateral instrument for an installment loan as well, right? So what does that mean, that you can use a CD as an installment loan for a collateral on an installment loan? So let's for say you take that same $1,000 CD and now you have a $500 installment loan. So now they, they say, okay, I've put, a, you've got $1,000 in this CD, you wanna borrow $500, we're gonna let you borrow $500, there you go. Now, Let's say you're starting out, you know, credits, you know, you're building your credit. They tell you 7% interest rate, or they may even be nice and say, you know what? Because you've got a CD with us, we'll give you a 5% interest rate. 
Well, if you got a 5% interest rate and you check and you subtract the 2% in yield that you're getting from your CD on that $500, what it really looks like to you now is a 3% interest rate. If they tell you 7%, what you're really getting is a 5% interest rate. You see how you're lowering your interest rate because you're using a facility that is actually generating you money every month as or every year to collateralize to be able to lower your borrowing rate as you're building credit. That's the smart way to do things, but it gets even better. So let's say now, right? Let's say now I've got this $500 that I've borrowed from the bank. It's an installment loan, right? Which means that $500 is outstanding. It's, I could pay it down with taking money out of my pocket to pay the principal, or I could do one better, right? Why don't I take the $500? Because it's going to be a 100% utilization ratio no matter how I do it. It's not a revolving facility. It's an installment loan. So it's 100% utilization no matter how I cut it, right? So why don't I do this, all right? So they've given me this $500 at, let's say, let's say it's 7%. Right? Let's just say. Okay, cool. I'm going to take my $500 and I'm going to put it in an index fund. Now check this out. Over a 10-year period of time, index funds on average bring about a 10 to 12% per annum rate of return. Let's walk into that. So let's just take the lower number, 10%. So if I take my money and I put that money that I borrowed from the bank in an index fund, right? Now check this out. They gave me a 7% interest rate. I'm yielding 2% on my CD. I'm already down to five, right? <laughs> check this out. So now I'm getting 10% a year on my index fund. So now the interest rate that I'm being charged I'm not actually paying really when you look at it because I'm net positive 5% still after the 5% interest rate that's left over from my investment. If I calculate inflation with that, I'm still net positive 2%. And because my rate of return on my index fund, I always reinvest, guess what? I'm getting compounded interest. And I'm still building credit. So I'm building credit for free. The net effect is free. In fact, not only is it free, I'm actually getting a 2% gain on the bank's money. I won. I won. That is the smart way to build credit. Now, I know you guys are going to have to watch this a few times. Uh, index funds is something I'm actually going to get into. I, uh, Anna asked, what is an index fund? Index funds is something I'm actually going to get into um, probably in about two or three weeks. I'm going to start talking about, you know, different types of investment accounts, what index of funds are, what 401ks are, what Roth IRA is, what IRA is you know, what cryptocurrency is, how they work. Like, I'm going to get into all of that. So, but an index fund is basically, and just the short of it, you know, just to get into it, the short of it, an index fund is, is basically a fund that you can invest into. Um, you have different kinds. You have some that are pegged to the S&P 500. So the money managers are investing in secure stocks uh, based on the S&P 500, Right. And then, you know, you have some that are like, um, they invest in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Some are like small cap. Like there is, so there, there's a number of different types of index funds. The best performing on the market right now come from Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, Fidelity. These are good places to go looking for top quality, well-performing index funds, right? And currently right now, um, uh, you know, from the beginning of the year to current, I mean, the, the index funds, top performing index funds are doing like 25%. It's crazy. Um, so it's a real good time to be in index funds. But, uh, but the net effect of the situation is what I'm showing you is how to use debt as a way to be able to build your portfolio. Because look, now check this out. Let me talk to you about your credit card. 
So you have to maintain a 30% utilization ratio at minimum, right? Why would I take that 30% and throw it into a pair of shoes or whatever when I can also throw that money into an index fund? And I can generate a rate of return on that and just pay a little small interest on the end of, on, on the credit card every month. You see what I'm saying? But that money is, is, is getting put to work in a securities portfolio. I'm slowly growing my securities portfolio. And as I continue to put money in the securities portfolio, and at a later time, we're going to talk about saving and, you know, saving to invest, right? How you save to invest. We're going to talk about that, right? But as you continue to put money in this securities portfolio, what you're essentially doing is building up a big enough securities portfolio to later borrow against at, at, at the London Interbank offering rate as a benchmark. So now where, you know, the prime rate was starting at three, London Interbank offering rate starts at like one. So if they add a 2% premium on that, I mean, gee, you're at 3% instead of 599 even if you got to 4%, it's 1.99% cheaper simply because you use your securities, which are highly liquid, as collateral for your loan. So you see how you begin to build into, not only are you building credit, but you're also building your investment portfolio at the same time. And you're offsetting your interest rate with smart investments that'll make it, it make sense. You make it make sense in the numbers. That is how you build credit. Now, granted, I understand that people are gonna probably have to watch this video about three, four, five times, right? And, and, and rewind and do all of that. And I think that's really cool, right? Cause that's what it's here for. Hashtag for the free, watch it all day long, right? But the reality of the situation is what I have just showed you is the smart way of building credit. That's a good question. Can you take the loan out if you use a Roth IRA? It's called a policy loan. And that's something I'm going to talk about when I talk about Roth IRA. When I get into the different types of investment accounts, yes, you can take policy loans against your investment accounts, your retirement accounts essentially, uh, to be able to access that money at an earlier time. You can do that, right? So, and, and it's smart if you're going to use that money for something that's going to generate you income, of course, right? Because a policy loan is actually really, really cheap. Like the interest on a policy loan is, is, is really, really cheap. So yes, that is doable, but I will be talking about that at a later time. Now, so the last thing I want to cover is managing credit. And I thought I was going to have to wait till next week to do this. But I realized that I have time to actually really get into this today. And it's really simple. And I've said it several times over. MyFICO.com. Go to MyFICO.com and spend the $40. It's going to cost you $40 a month. But you're going to get all three of your FICO scores. You're going to get access to all three of your credit profiles. And you're going to get to see what all of your, what your FICO score looks like under all the different FICO scoring models. See, the MyFICO.com is owned by the Fair Isaac Credit Organization, and the Fair Isaac Credit Organization is actually the organization that runs the FICO scoring model. So if you're going to get information, it makes the most sense to get it from the horse's mouth. So spend the $40, make the investment in yourself, spend the $40 a month, and go get MyFICO.com. Now, number two. Most people don't think about this in our community because unfortunately, most people in our community don't have the best of credit, so they don't care, right? But the reality of the situation, as you start building credit, as you start growing credit, identity theft becomes a big concern for you because if you've got great credit, somebody wants to steal your credit for the benefit of being able to get something in your name, right? So you need to set up credit monitoring alerts. What are credit monitoring alerts? Credit monitoring alerts allow you to be able to set things up in such a way to where you are now able, right, to essentially, when somebody wants to apply for something in your name, they have to call you, you have to answer questions based on your credit profile, they have to be able to answer the questions on your credit profile to prove that they are you to be able to go ahead and get credit. 
They're gonna call the number that they have on the credit profile. This is why credit management is important and keeping the information on your credit profiles updated, right? With the most recent information. Because if the information is not current, right? then they'll call a number that you no longer have and it makes it difficult for them to be able to verify that the person that's trying to get the credit is the person that is really the person whose credit profile this is, right? So that's my short, quick, and dirty on managing credit. MyFICO.com, credit monitoring alerts, and keep your credit profile updated with your most recent information so that way you can protect your identity and protect this credit profile that you're working so hard to build. So that's what I had today. That's what I wanted to offer today. So let's get into these questions now. I'm sure there are questions. I see two already. Let's see. So is Edward Jones a reputable company for financial advisement? Well, um, it's Edward Jones. So yes, they are a reputable company. I will tell you that, right? Um, you know, there are levels to this Wall Street thing, right? And so I would say that Edward Jones probably has the junior varsity working over there. These are people that probably started at other institutions and couldn't cut the mustard. So they were let go and they go to places like Edward Jones and Northwestern Mutual and places like that as financial advisors because that's like the junior varsity. That's the second rate, right? So, you know, the top tier guys work at Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and Citigroup and you know, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, you know, these are, these are Fidelity. These are kind of top tier firms, right? So they get the top talent, right? And everybody else just kind of gets the leftovers. So that's my opinion on Edward Jones. They are a reputable institution. Yes. Um, always be sure that when you're looking at uh, investment advisors and financial advisors, uh, you're looking at firms, uh, make sure you check their fees. Um, what are the fees that they're charging you? You know, a lot of people, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, and I'm going to mention this briefly, but, you know, when people invested in the Tulsa real estate fund, nobody really paid attention to the 5.5% management fee. That's extremely high. Nobody charges that, right? So that would have been, you know, a, a non-starter. You know, if you understand how the fees affect your investment, you understand that that's a non-starter. So, so let me see. There was another, give me a second, let me see. The second question says, I hired an accountant who has his own practice, but he is not a CPA. Should I trust him? Ha. Huh. So, you know, I guess the question that I would ask you is, is he managing your business financials? Like, is he responsible for uh, your balance sheet reconciliations, your... Uh, cash flow statement, P&L statement, uh, your income statement. Is he doing the accounting and all of that stuff for you? Because if the answer is yes, and this is for business purposes, I highly recommend that you get yourself a CPA. Not saying that this person is not reputable, not saying that this person is not talented. I don't know this person, so I can't opine to the veracity of their statements or the quality in, of their skill set and, and knowledge uh, and their subject matter and their work product. I can't speak to any of that. But what I can tell you is this. As, as, as someone who, who has been doing this for over 14 years, there is no way on God's green earth that you would be looking at my financials or helping me you know, keep my balance sheet and stuff together if you were not a CPA. Um, that, that's a difficult stretch for me, right? Um, and a CPA with some, some serious experience, you know, that, that's a stretch for me. So, you know, my, my answer to that question is, is, you know, that now if he's just helping you with minor accounting stuff, or if he's just helping you on the personal side, that's cool. But understand that, you know, he may be talented at that and that may be a cheaper route for you to go. But the fact of the matter is, you know, he can't represent you before the IRS, Understand that. So, you know, if you get into an IRS issue based on something this guy did, he can't represent you in front of the IRS. You need somebody that can go to bat for you in front of the IRS if things go left. And that's CPA, an enrolled agent, tax lawyers. These are the type of people that you want to be dealing with, right? 
So, so that's that. So net effect, if it's for business, go get a CPA. Uh, okay, let's see. How would you use credit to buy real estate? So when we have our real estate discussion, um, when I get into the, and I'm going to get into a deep, detailed uh, discussion over several weeks about real estate, and that is a discussion that we are going to have. So I will save that question for that time. But thank you for the question. Let's see. Do investment firms do margin trading and how common is it? Yes. Yes. That's very common. Margin, margin trading is a very common thing. Yeah, it's very common. You're borrowing against an already existing securities portfolio to be able to uh, invest in other securities. Yes, that's margin. Um, so, you know, they, they have safe asset lists or asset lending list that they have, which, which tells you which securities they're willing to lend on. Um, so that's kind of that, right? But yes, they do do margin lending, but you can also do uh, securities, uh, uh, securities loans as well, which I talked about. Um, would he be considered a bookkeeper? Yes, an accountant would be considered a bookkeeper. He's definitely not a CPA. Okay, Anna, the question option doesn't show for me. You talked about overall, util overall utilization. How does deferred school loans pay into that? Okay, so... Deferred school loans, right, there's still, there's still an overall utilization factor on that because, I mean, it's still outstanding debt at the end of the day, right? So that debt is still outstanding. It's just because it's deferred and you're not paying it on it right at that moment, right, it still counts towards your overall uh, credit utilization ratio for a fact because you still owe the money. It stops counting when you stop owing. That makes sense. How should I start a business with financial aid in the midst of repairing credit to eventually do more? So the interesting thing is within the next two to three weeks, I'm going to be talking about a corporate structure, starting businesses, how to do business plans, what you need to be thinking about when you're doing business plans, um, how investors think, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So that's going to be credit covered at a later time, Anna, but I will be covering that. Um, that is a topic in this financial literacy journey that we are taking. So uh, thank you for the question, but, um, you know, just save that question. It, you will get your answer in time. I promise you that. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, let me see if I missed any. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, let's see. Um, no, I don't think I missed any. Does anybody have any other questions? Any other questions? This is the time. Okay, awesome, guys. So I covered everything I wanted to cover I know this was, you know, a little bit complicated, you know, so feel free um, to, you know, ask any questions that you have via DM. Um, you know, I'm always available uh, via DM at any time. Let me see here. I'm sorry, there are two more questions, so let me get to those. Um, we're running a little low on time too, guys, so um, let's see. Hey, Fred, what do you think about credit cards? Do you recommend them? Um I encourage you to watch this video. Um, I think you came in a little late. Rewatch this video. But yes, credit cards are a good thing as long as you're using them to create uh, value for yourself. Um, if you're just using them to, you know, do nothing, then, you know, or, or buy bad debt or get involved in, you know, things that don't create value for yourself, then that's a bad debt and that's not recommended. But credit cards have their value if you use them properly. Um, thank you for the question. Let's see here. Uh... What can you tell us about borrowing money again, borrowing against your money when having an LLC and how does that process look? That is something that is also going to be covered when I talk about starting businesses and how that works. Yes, you can collateralize assets, both tangible and intangible, uh, when you have an LLC. Um, and that can be cash flows, that can be accounts receivables, I mean, that can be uh, equipment, that can be real estate. You know, there are a number of, that can be intellectual property, it could be patents. You know, there are a number of things that could be collateralized and used for borrowing when you get into the business side of this. But I will talk about that when I get into starting up businesses and starting to, and, and how you start a business for scale. Uh, but definitely thank you for the question there. I appreciate that. How do you maintain uh, having multiple accounts and low overall utilization? 
um, it, it, it's about counting the numbers, right? So it's all about, you know, like I talked about earlier, it, it comes down to, you know, being able to, to do the math. Like that's why you need myfico.com. You need to know what's on your FICO score on your, on your credit report. So that way you can be able to, uh, count these numbers up the right way and make sure that your overall utilization ratio is falling between 50 and 55%. And you begin, begin to change your utilization on your revolving lines in a certain way to make sure you fall back down to that. Because if you're at 60% and you get to 65%, right, that means you've got several different accounts. That means you need to lower the utilization ratios on your revolving lines. So that means if you're at 30%, you might need to lower all your revolving lines by 5%. You may need to lower three of your revolving lines by 5% or 10%. It depends on what your credit mix looks like and what your overall utilization number is versus the amount of actual outstanding debt that you have. So you're going to be able to, to calculate the numbers properly and get down to the ideal overall utilization ratio, right? Uh, so I, I, let me see, I think there's another question here. I got time for like one or two more and then we're gonna be out of time here. Let's see. Okay, I answered that question already. I'm sorry, guys, give me a second here. Let's see how I get back. Okay, let's see. Should I close out credit cards that I've paid off? Will that affect my credit score? So closing out credit cards actually, and I actually talked about this maybe one or two uh, videos ago. Um, I talked about, you know, closing out credit cards. So when you close out a credit card, you know, that, that, that credit mix is no longer there. So that utilization is no longer there. Even if you're not using it, that outstanding line is not there. And when you close it out, you also lose a lot of that history too. So, you know, sometimes that might be a long running car that has history on it that is really helping your FICO score. So yes, it can because it changes your credit mix. It changes your outstanding balance limits. It changes your credit utilization ratios. It changes a lot of things and that can help you or hurt you depending on your specific credit profile. So you have to understand your specific credit profile and your specific credit situation to make a decision on if that's a good idea for you. But if that's your longest running credit line, it's probably not a good idea. You know what I mean? Especially if it's been paid as agreed the whole time. So that's kind of, you know, my answer on that. But again, that's a general statement. I can't speak to your specific credit situation overall. Um, but um, guys, unfortunately, um, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time here. You know, so I want to tell you guys, thank you so much for spending the time. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I hope everybody learned something. Um, uh, Mufasa, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm humbled. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. Um, but, you know, please feel free to like, subscribe, share, follow, tell everyone you know about this information. Uh, the more eyes we get on the content. You know, the more people that will be able to benefit from this content. Thank everybody. I thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to my DM. You know, I may not always respond right away, but I'm pretty responsive and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, as always, we hashtag get real woke around here. It's always hashtag for the free around here. And we always hashtag make it make sense. So that's it, y'all. I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get on off of here now and get back to football Sunday. Y'all have a great day.